As a community, we build empathy, curiosity, joy, and connection when we share stories with you. Welcome to Storytellers Project, part of the USA Today Network. Welcome to the Des Moines Storytellers Project. Thank you so much for being here for another night of live storytelling. Tonight's theme is my favorite of the year, travel. <laughs> what is it about travel that rejuvenates us and fills our spirits and helps us see life and the lives of others in a new way? Each of the stories selected for you tonight are completely different, but they are all defined by a transcendental or life-changing experience. Our first story tonight is from Keith Knapp, who is going to tell us about a wild trip he had before you know what. So I finally made it down to Patagonia, and there I was standing on the shores of Lago Argentino, the largest freshwater lake in the country of Argentina. And there in the distance were the Andes, snow and ice covered. In two days, I'd be meeting up with my two guides and 14 other people that I'd not yet met to hike around this region for the next eight days. Down here, we're in cold desert country, flat and rolling terrain that's edged by mountains that come out of the ground so steeply you think Hercules was pounding these rock towers from below with a hammer. But there's also golden grasses and turquoise blue lakes and brown and orange canyons and snow and glaciers, sometimes all within one windswept view. I love, I love how still and remote this place is. I just can't help it. Each day, we tend to start out down here along the rivers and the valleys, but inevitably we reach a part of our path that requires the use of hiking poles. It's a set, set, step, set, step kind of cadence with a complete focus on the ground. And we, I have to remind myself to look up at the scenery and experience the awe that it gives us every time we do so, no matter where we are. And every day, I have this mantra, layer up and buff up. You know those tubes of cloth we all got used to. You pull them up over your face and your head. Out there, they were essential field gear. They protected me from the cold and the constant wind and the strong Argentine sun. Little did I know that in a few days, that essential gear would be there for me in a completely different context. Then somewhere around day five or six, the whispers started, the field guides started saying things like, there's something going on out there in the world, we're not quite sure what, but the Argentine president is talking about closing the country. <laughs> this information, this story may as well have been a fa fantasy or fable to me for the impact it had. We were in one of the most remote parts of the world. So we went from there, and I also was thinking about the fact that we had another destination coming up, and it was the Perito Marino Glacier. The Perito Marino is one of the few, if not the only, glacier that's still growing in Argentina. And I remember feeling the cold wind as it came across its surface on my face and hearing these building-sized blocks of ice calving off into the water. And it was a full sensory experience. And it brought that awe back for this place, this region. And then somewhere a little after that, and I'm not sure quite on the timing because it happened so quickly, sure enough, the Argentine government decided they were gonna close the national parks. And most of Patagonia is national park. So we had to leave. And I remember feeling this kind of sense of disbelief but acceptance that I've only experienced a few times in my life, and not usually because something good is happening. And I remember th being so thankful for the fact that that was true. So we got back to the ranch that we were staying in that night, and that's when another shoe dropped. Sure enough, the Argentine government is closing the borders, and we think it's going to happen at midnight tomorrow. I remember looking out at this plate glass window at one of the most remote places again in the world, all of the scenery that I just described, 
and having a conversation with my travel agent about different routes home, to home as, as countries closed all over the world. It was one of the most bizarre conversations I've ever had in my life. I'd gone from embracing the remoteness and the isolation of this place to wanting to get out for something we thought was caused by people getting together. <laughs> and I realized then that I also had, that I'd been lucky. I'd actually gotten a flight out of Buenos Aires the next morning and then a red eye straight to Miami at 11 p.m., just one hour before the country was supposed to close. But I also realized, well, I thought a little bit about it. I felt a little bit like a Cinderella. What's going to happen if I don't get out at midnight? But I also didn't want to know, so I put that aside. And I'd been, again, I'd been lucky. And I also needed to get out of this ranch house, and I had to get back out into the wild. And I walked around that ranch, 10,000 acres, all by myself, not another soul in sight, and saw, just brought it in again. And I saw these cloud formations that I knew I'd never see in Iowa. And I was so grateful, and the awe came back for that one last time. The next morning, we were in the Patagonia Airport, El Calfante. It is chaos. There's lines upon lines upon lines. And we were lucky again. We had tickets. So we're going to the gate, and I remember looking down and seeing our two guides in these lines, trying to get tickets to back to their respective home countries, neither of which was the US. And I realized they'd helped us before they'd helped themselves. Again, two of the many strangers that are gonna help and save me along this trip. And I never know if they make it back or when. We take off to Buenos Aires and the chaos is cranked up 10, 100 times. There's not a quiet corner that I usually seek out when I travel or something silence anywhere in this place. But I remember my goal, it's to get home, it's to get to Iowa, it's to get to the States. And then I get a text from a family member. What can we do to help? And I respond with nothing. There's nothing. I'll let you know if I make it out. And then after more lines and more waiting, I make it to the gate. And it is full of people just like me. It's probably 10 or 10.30 at night at this point. They're just trying to get home. But it's hushed. It's very, very quiet. And I remember seeing a fellow in a Green Bay Packer shirt across the way. So I make my way over there. And I explained to him that I grew up just an hour and a half, two hours from there. And he's from Wisconsin. And we talk about home in these hushed tones for a while. Nobody's talking about what might happen. And I'm so grateful for the fact that this fellow showed up at exactly the right time that I needed him. And then there's an announcement. The, the, the flight will be delayed till 11.45, 11.50, just 10 or 15 minutes before midnight. And I think, man, they're cutting this close. Boy, are they cutting this close. Oh my gosh, they're cutting this close. They ask us to get in line to load. And I start my mental checklist that I usually do when I fly. Except it's holding much more significance this time. Maybe life and death experience. I just don't know. There's the plane, check. There's the pilot and the crew, check. <laughs> I, get up to the, I get up to the boarding agent she says, sir, sir, I'm sorry, you can't take that bottle of water on the plane. I've literally just filled it up. I pull it out of my backpack and I'm looking around and I pour it into a plastic bag to lots of disapproving looks, but I know I'm not getting out of this line. <laughs> I buff up for one last time, I think, to get on the plane. And I'm loading my backpack up on the, on the overhead and I notice that the lady that's gonna be on this eight or nine hour flight with me is coughing and coughing and coughing. <laughs> I sit down and she turns to me and she says, would you like to see the note I have that says I don't have this disease? <laughs> I said, no, fine, thank you. Very grateful for the fact that she's actually concerned about me, but knowing I'm not gonna delay this flight or find another seat on a full, fl full plane or delay it at all. We're in this together. But the doors haven't closed. It's well past midnight at this point. Why haven't the doors closed? Why haven't the doors closed? My checklist is on hold, then the door is closed, check. Why aren't they pushing back? Why aren't they pushing back? Well past midnight, why aren't they pushing back? I'm so focused, I, can't, I almost don't feel that slight nudge of this huge plane. It's push back, check. And then it's, then it's wheels up and we're off to Miami, Miami, we hope. And I watch that flight tracker all night and it gets about halfway there and for some reason in my brain I say, oh well they can't turn around now or land somewhere else. 
And sure enough, hours later, we land in Miami. There's an announcement from the pilot. You will all be health checked one by one, row by row. I settle back. I've long ago resigned. I'm not making my Chicago O'Hare flight. I only had about 75 minutes to begin with after all the delays and whatnot. But I think to myself, I have all the gear I need. I'll just walk to Des Moines. <laughs> then there's another announcement. Get off the plane as quickly and orderly as possible. And if you see your name in an orange tag on the wall, grab it up, get your luggage, and wave it around. What is this? What was a health check at that point? Hazmat suits came to mind when they said that. So sure enough, there's my name, Nap, orange tag, grab it up, get my luggage. I'm in customs and immigration in the long lines there, and I'm waving it around. <laughs> Another stranger comes up to me and takes me up, puts me at the front of the line. I have much, much, much less than an hour to make my Chicago flight. Check, 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 drop your luggage and run. And I'm running through the Miami airport with my backpack on. And I'm one of the last people to get on the flight to Chicago. And it's partially empty. We're going to O'Hare. How is this possible? I land in O'Hare, and I'm not having to move around and avoid people in the terminal, and I can sit by myself. That's right. The country has closed down. <laughs> I get on my Des Moines flight, even emptier. I get into the Des Moines airport, and it's pretty much deserted, as are the roadways. The Iowa the Iowa I arrived at looked normal, but wasn't quite there. It was different. It was something other than what I'd left. And I realized then that I'd had to quarantine for two weeks. And friends and colleagues bring me food and drop it on my driveway. And I talk to them from my second floor town home and thank them for doing what they're doing. I didn't know it then, but I know it now, that this trip back from Patagonia, this ups and the downs and the not knowing and not knowing and not knowing, not only taught me how to survive COVID, but how to embrace the changes and the not knowing and not knowing that it actually introduced for the next months and years. It was a great teacher, this trip back through this chaos, this craziness to this calmness and a lesson that I'll be forever grateful for. It also taught me, well, reminded me to always be kind to strangers because you never know who might actually inspire you, save you, or get you home, or all of the above, all of which had occurred with me. And last but not least, always carry at least one or two buffs with you, because you don't know if they're going to be good in the plane or in the field. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. If only we got a little warning before the next international pandemic breaks out. Then um, our next storyteller of the evening, I think, is the first puppeteer we've ever had on stage with us. Puppets can get away with murder. Well, not murder exactly, but more controversial politi political discourse than you might imagine. My parents were the victims of a political system, that of the Nazis. My father was the descendant of a prominent Jewish family, but he was also a Lutheran minister in the confessional church that opposed Hitler. When the, came, when the Gestapo came and got him and locked him up, they didn't tell him whether he was being imprisoned for being a Christian or for being a Jew. In any case, he had friends with loud voices who made so much of a public stink that they finally decided it would be easier to release my father than to put up with the bad publicity. But of course, he had to leave the country. And that's how we ended up in the United States. When I was six or seven, my mother ordered a set of puppets from a craftswoman she knew in Germany. It was a traditional set, Kasperle, kind of like our Punch and Judy sets, Kasperle, his wife Gretel, his mother-in-law, a devil, and other characters. <laughs> our set included a butler in a black robe and a white collar. Well, as you can imagine, he wasn't a butler for long in our family with that black clerical robe and the white clerical collar. He became a pastor. And my father acted out little scenes between him and the devil, where the devil tempted the pastor to do all sorts of outrageous things. I was entranced. My father was, I was 13 when my father died, and my mother gave me the puppets. They got a lot of use, 
even earning money for my Girl Scout troop when we decided to cater birthday parties. I didn't have to bake a cake or anything. All I had to do was show up and do a puppet show for the entertainment. Fast forward to 1984, when I'd already been a professional puppeteer for 10 years. My best friend and puppet partner, Terry Jean, broke her foot during a summer gig, and she was laid up for two months. All of our shows were written for two puppeteers, so I was at loose ends. I figured I may as well use the time to go to Germany, visit relatives, and attend an international puppetry festival in Dresden, in East Germany, behind the Iron Curtain. I was amazed and delighted at the quality and the scope of the East German puppetry. In a country geographically the same size as Iowa, they had 17 permanent puppet theaters, all state supported, at least in part. They had full staffs, they had puppeteers, puppet makers, playwrights, directors, administrative staff, and their shows were good. The thing that really amazed me was how much political satire they could get away with doing. Remember Kasperla, the puppet hero of my childhood? Well, here he was again, only this time he and Gretel and Zeppel and the others took on the characteristics, recognizable characteristics, of government officials and made merciless fun of them. I was amazed that they could get away with that in a country that was essentially a police state. But the thing is, nobody takes puppets seriously. That means you can slip in all sorts of things that only the people that are really paying attention notice. Take my puppet troupe, for instance. We mostly perform for children, a lot of folk tales and other stories, but we don't shy away from inserting a little political comment when it seems appropriate. One day we were doing a show in our little downtown park in West Liberty when our lefty friend Rod came with a friend. The story was The Rabbit and the Moon. It's a Mexican folk tale about a rabbit who has to leave his village cross a desert pursued by a coyote in order to come to a place where he can find work and make a living for his family. Naturally, we added a wall to the story. <laughs> the wall my husband made for us looked suspiciously like the Mexican border wall, corrugated metal, and Ellie, my Mexican partner puppeteer, spray painted no pass on it. When we got all done with the show, the kids had loved it. Everybody clapped and cheered, and Rod's friend leaned over to him and said, I wish they'd do political theater. <laughs> to which Rod said, what do you think that was? <laughs> when I got back from East Germany and reported into Terry Jean, she and I started figuring out ways we could go back to East Germany and see more of their wonderful puppetry. I wrote a letter to the director of UNAMA East Germany, the East German branch of an international puppetry organization that has branches in 99 countries and is dedicated to promoting peace and understanding through the art of puppetry. I told him that we'd love to see more East German puppetry and meet some of the puppeteers and maybe see some of their operations. He responded by inviting us to perform at their next national festival. The only Western troupe invited. So in 1987, we packed up our puppets and our suitcases and boarded a plane for Berlin. My West German cousin, Hamann, met us at the airport and took us to Checkpoint Charlie, where we would be crossing the border from West Berlin to East Berlin. East Berlin. The name sent shudders up Western spines. It was separated from West Berlin by an ugly concrete wall. The Western side looked pretty much like any other Western big city with department stores and nice restaurants and, and billboards and neon signs and traffic jams. The Eastern side looked like a concrete desert. 
There were lots of co concrete high-rises that looked as if looked shoddy and looked as if they'd been thrown up in a hurry after World War II, because indeed they had. East Germany did not have the benefit of the Marshall Plan that rebuilt West Germany. Not only that, uh, the state ordered the mean, owned the means of production, so most of the things that were made in East Germany were exported to earn money and not to be enjoyed by the people who lived there. We got to Checkpoint Charlie, our border crossing, and we were like rock stars. It turned out the border guard loved puppetry. <laughs> she was very impressed that we'd been invited to perform at the National Festival. That's quite an honor, she said. Oh, those puppets, I would love to have seen them, but to unpack them would be way too much work. Go, have a good time. And so the bleakness of the city was in sharp contrast to the warmth of our welcome. My cousins, my East Berlin cousins, were waiting for us on the other side with bells on. We walked the seven blocks to their family home in the Glinkastrasse, where their mother, my cousin, was waiting for us with coffee and cake. The next morning, we boarded the train for Magdeburg, the festival city. When we arrived, there were two young men waiting for us at the station with big bouquets of flowers. The first one, Aunt Bernd, asked us in German, sind Sie die amerikanischen Puppenspieler? To which Andre quickly translated, he says, are you the American puppeteers? Andre was kind of disappointed when he realized I was fluent in German. <laughs> but on the other hand, Terry Jean's German skills were very limited. So he stuck to her and translated every word for her, driving her a little batty. <laughs> they were assigned to be our guides. They took us everywhere. They, took, they came to shows with us. They took us shopping to spend the money that we'd earned performing, which would be no good when we got at home. Um, we went out to eat together. Why, they even took us to see the Till Eulenspiegel fountain in, the, in one of the main squares in Magdeburg. It was a fountain that depicted our puppet hero, our namesake, Till Eulenspiegel, who had reportedly played some of his best tricks in Magdeburg. One day, they showed up in and bounced Trabi. The Trabi is, was short for Trabant, which was the car of East German manufacture. A tiny little car made of plastic with a two-stroke engine, kind of like a lawnmower, spewing pollution behind it as it went down the road. <laughs> we got in, and I said, where are we going, Bant? He said, there's a little village nearby that's celebrating its 1,050th birthday. They're having a little festival. So off we went. Terry Jean had been feeling a little homesick, but she perked right up when we got to that festival. It looked just like an Iowa town festival. She said, look, they've got a beer tent, they've got a fire engine, they've got a petting zoo. We could be in Iowa. <laughs> to which I responded, plus 900 years. <laughs> Magdeburg was far enough from the border that it didn't get much in the way of Western television. And with no television of interest to see, people mobbed the puppet shows. Bant and Andre came along too, of course. After each of our shows, the other puppeteers came up to ask us questions. Did they ask how we made our puppets, or why we chose the story we chose, or anything like that? No. They wanted to know how on earth you could make a living as a puppeteer in a market economy. Just three years later, they had to find out for themselves. At the end of the week, Bant and Andre took us back to the train station, and we started the long trip home. Two years later, when the wall came down, we started hearing about the extent to which the Stasi, the secret police, had infiltrated people's daily lives. Neighbors reported on neighbors. Family members reported on family members. If you were a civil servant, even if you were a museum director or a library director, you had to have regular meetings with the Stasi and submit reports. 
it dawned on me, wait, Bount and Andre weren't just being nice guys. They were reporting on us to the Stasi. At first, it made me feel really creepy. But the more I thought about it, the more I was at peace with that. After all, they were, living with, they were doing what they had to do to live in, within their paradigm, just as we were doing what we had to do to live within ours. And, at, and in spite of everything, we got to be friends. They really were nice guys. I've been thinking about this trip a lot lately. There's such a level of hatred and fear in the air these days. It makes me think of the fear that Germans had of the Jews during the Nazi era, and the fear that all of us Americans had of the Soviet bloc during the Cold War. I wonder, is fear just part of our DNA? In any case, I know one thing, it is totally non-productive. No matter how big our differences, political or otherwise, at the bottom of it, we're all human beings much more alike than we are different. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Monica Leo. Next is a brave man very near and dear to my heart, Shir Safi. We met in late 2022 after hundreds of Afghan refugees settled in Iowa after the fall of Kabul. He's showing enormous courage again tonight, especially when you hear the end of his story. It was September 11, 2001, a day aged in history. While the rest of the world watched in horror, as the World Trade Center in New York City was attacked, the people of Pakistan, my family's temporary home, seemed to celebrate. News of the attack reached to every corner of the country, and the air was filled with a mix of shock, confusion, and far too many, a twisted sense of triumph. But for my father, mother, and siblings, that fateful day struck a very different chord. We had become refugees in Pakistan in 1996 when the Taliban took over Afghanistan. We left everything we knew in Afghanistan behind and journeyed to a foreign land where we didn't know anyone and didn't speak the language. We, in that time, we uh, settled in a small town where we rented a small house. We had to learn a new language, make new friends, and find work to support ourselves. We were grateful just to be alive and safe from the violence and oppression of the Taliban. But that fateful day, September 11th would turn our lives upside down. As my father looked at the image of planes flying into the Twin Towers on the television screen, he felt a deep sadness engulfing him. He raised his voice in a local tea shop condemning the acts of terror. His words resonated with some of the people around him, and all crowd turned against him. That's why he's condemning those acts. The people around him, they were all pro-terrorism, who were celebrating the death of all innocent people, what happened in that day. But that was not only a bad day for America, it was also a bad day for my family when we were living with, between the people who hit uh, all humanity. When my uh, dad condemned these acts as the uh, people uh, came against him, so one of my uncle, he intervened, pulling my father from the mob 
Together they rushed back home, seeking refuge in, within the four walls of their humble dwelling. Fear and uncertainty gripped my family as they barricaded themselves in their, inside their home. The sound of the mob grew louder. Our belongings were thrown onto the street. My family huddled together, their hearts pounding with terror. My brothers and sisters, tears streaming down their faces, struggled to comprehend. We were all innocent victims in a land consumed by hatred. My father, his lips trembling with sadness and helplessness, he knew we were all paying the price for his standing up against inhuman acts. The days after that day turned into weeks, and my family slowly gathered the pieces of our shattered lives, wondering what to do next. In time, we came to realize that Pakistan had come to embrace terrorism and extremism, but there was little we could do, at least then. Our hurt act in Pakistan as we witnessed the insensitivity and callousness of those who celebrated the brutal acts of Osama bin Laden. People celebrated the terrorists, uh, the, people celebrated the violence and glorified terrorists while we lived with a profound sense of betrayal and disillusionment. Amid all that darkness, however, glimpses of hope would eventually emerge. Ironically, that hope flourished after, the chaos, after that chaos that was the fall of Kabul in 2021. But to understand that journey, you first must understand what it's like being a child of war. I was born in 1992, a time when Afghanistan engulfed in a chaos and violence. My family, like many other Afghan refugees, they flee to the Pakistan because of the constant shelling on our houses in mountainous area due to hunger and several, uh, several other challenges. Going to Pakistan was not a choice. That was the only option that we have to do that. Otherwise, we could not survive. In Pakistan, we stayed for eight years, and these were the bad year, very bad year of our life. Sorry, they were five years, not eight years. We returned after 9-11 to the Afghanistan. I graduated from school. I joined the Afghan National Army when I was 16 years old. Then I fought against those terrorist and radical groups which were started in Pakistan and Iran. I fought for 12 years several times getting injured and returning back to the front lines. We were still happy because we had country, we had honor, but we didn't know what will happen next. In 2020, the peace agreement came around. People of Afghanistan, and the soldiers, they were feeling the betrayal that America was giving up and Taliban would win. In August 2021, that actually happened. Taliban took control of Al Afghanistan. I was staying in Helmand province, which is the southwestern part of Afghanistan, and that was the only one and last battlefield in Afghanistan. 
The Taliban demanded us to surrender because we were only a uh, unit that we were still fighting. Rest of the Afghanistan was under control of them. They took the Kabul and the palace, uh, the Taliban chief, uh, uh, the supreme leader was in the palace. So we decided to not surrender and we keep fighting. But we don't have that much support. We couldn't stay for a long time. Over 350 soldiers died and killed and injured in that battlefield around me. And I had like a small radio in my hand, like at that stage. I took last aircraft with a few of my soldiers and made it to the Kandahar airport. And in Kandahar, as, uh, that aircraft was also shot and it wasn't able to take uh, more people with us. So few of us, we could make it to the Kabul through it. In Kabul, we were guided to the dedicated gate for us. We, get inter, uh, we, we entered in by that gate. We saw the faces of horror. People were desperately trying to get out. Everyone was trying to get out. Maybe you saw on the television. So that was a very bad moment. We were devastated. I lived with a herd full of millions of sorrows. Behind I left my wife and two kids who couldn't get out. Like many others, I came to the United States in 2021. First I stayed in Washington DC and Virginia over a month for my immigration process. And after that I came to Iowa in October 2021. I was staying in Urbandale Hotel. Then I met some other Afghan refugees who came after me. And they were also new like me, but most of them, they couldn't speak English. So we had a lot of uh, challenges. Even I could speak English, I, could, I didn't know how to navigate system here. So how they can do. In those days, one of the Afghan refugee at 25 years old. He went out from the hotel and tr uh, he was trying to find a store, but car hit him and Urbandale Police Department found his dead body. So I realized people really need help. And I, I started teaching them how to cross the road, what the signals are for, where they can find a grocery store, what store is for what, how to get the emergency help, what is 9-11, what is the bus stop look like here, how you can ride a bus. But that wasn't enough because I don't have, I don't have any resources to do more than this. And luckily, I met two amazing people in those days. Irene Bill and Ellison Human from Des Moines Refugee Support. And after that day, I never felt I'm alone. They stand beside me and start helping Afghan refugees in hotels. We start taking them food and groceries to the hotel rooms. People start receiving warm clothes. They get rides and other helps, almost everything we needed. After that all, I still thought, and I felt luck of the gathering point for Afghan community. So eventually I worked with others and, uh, and uh, found a community-based uh, program. In July 2022, I founded an organization called Afghan Partners in Iowa. The goal is to help each other and provide services by Afghans to the fellow Afghans. As an executive director of that organization, I'm providing services to the Afghan refugees in the Iowa. My organization lead a lot of work. It's a new organization. I'm working every day to improve it. After all that, as I saw everything almost done, I remembered I still wanted to go to the college. One of my best friend, Erin Bill, 
director of the live mascot program for Drake University. She told me about a bright college program in Drake University. And that bright college program is, has like a big opportunity for the non-traditional students, which I am. I'm very thankful of everyone who supported me to join the Bright College, and I'm very proud to be a Drake student. Last month, my family made from Pakistan to the Qatar, stayed in Qatar for three weeks. And do you know what's happening tonight? After three and a half years waiting, my wife and two kids, right after this talking, they are going to meet me. <laughs> Thank you. So my that all journey, they taught me if you have sincere friends beside you, they will never let you give up. If you won't give up, as I did here, the people I took their names and their other hundred of volunteer friends, they never let me to give up. If we could overcome a battle of life and death so everyone can, I would say never give up and keep forward moving. Long live Afghanistan, long live America. Thank you, Safi. I think I speak for all of us when I say, get out of here. Go give your wife and kids a hug. Next, I'd like to introduce Alicia Holker, a regular listener at Storytellers events who decided to tell one of her best travel stories. All I can remember from my childhood is being backstage at different Russian theaters, watching my mom perform. My mom is an actress. Her theater troupe was always on the go, on a big bus. And before I had to go to school, which is around six years old, where that bus went, I went. My mom always wanted to be an actress. And it so happened that she got pregnant with me during her sophomore year of college. I was born in Angarsk, a small town in Siberia, where the most popular activity was ice skating. And thanks to the severe cold weather, you could do it most of the year. <laughs> I lived with my grandma for a couple of years, while my mom finished school and uh, was ready to start her career. I was so excited when my mom would come visit from Moscow for the holidays. She had denim clothes, head to toes. <laughs> Nobody had denim clothes in Siberia. <laughs> my mom wore perfumes and brought dolls that were beyond my imagination. When she was done with school, she was ready to have me join her on that tour bus. For many, traveling is a getaway. For me, it was an opportunity to be with my awesome mom and her awesome friends, and to be behind the scenes of where the magic happens. And it was way more fun than living with my grandma in a small Siberian town. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I didn't know it back then, I believe this is when I found my passion for travel. In the 80s, traveling abroad from Russia was not allowed. But in 1992, after the, uh, after the Iron Curtain in the communist USSR was toppled, we were able to go to the neighboring countries. This is when my parents started a business, selling leather and fur coats that they purchased from China and Turkey. <laughs> when I was around 10 years old, I was invited to one of their trips to Turkey. I remember everything about that first trip down to the smell of the airplane. Back then, passengers were allowed to smoke on an airplane. <laughs> and every adult made sure to take advantage of this opportunity to the fullest. It was nearly impossible to see through the cloud of smoke in the cabin. I didn't mind it at all, though. I thought it was absolutely fascinating. 
Turkey is a home to a unique blend of European and Middle Eastern cultures with a rich history spanning thousands of years. After we took care of business and bought the leather goods, we explored ancient ruins, a stunning blue mosque, bustling bazaars and delicious cuisine. The most amazing part was the fact that despite the differences in the way we looked and spoke, people were so welcoming, making us feel like home. I remember my dad's business partners were sharing stories in broken English while introducing me to authentic Turkish meals and exotic sweets. Sitting in a cloud of smoke on a return plane home, I found myself thinking that the world wasn't scary as I anticipated prior to this adventure, but instead it was full of kind people, beautiful views, and delicious food. As soon as I turned 18, a legal age to travel solo, I took a trip to Egypt. My destination, Sharm el Sheikh. With its only being a six hour flight to good weather year round, it is a very popular vacation spot amongst Russians. The first experience I remember is my wild drive to the hotel. My taxi driver, Ahmed, sped through the streets, honking his horn and swerving around other cars with alarming speed. My heart was racing with fear. But as we continued our journey, I began to realize that there was a, a method to Ahmed's madness. Despite the reckless driving, he seemed to have a sixth sense for the flow of traffic, anticipating every obstacle and navigating through the chaos with remarkable ease. We made it to the hotel extremely quickly, and this was an experience I will never forget. Sharm el-Sheikh is known for its beautiful beaches, clear waters, and a world-class diving sites. It is still one of my favorite vacation destinations. I've managed to visit Egypt 10 times since I turned 18. When buying a tour package, a tourist agent advised to be respectful of local customs and laws. He told me to dress modestly, especially if visiting religious sites, and be aware of any cultural norms that might be different from my own. This conversation made me extra alert to my surroundings. In Egypt, I've noticed that there were no local women working in a hotel. After speaking with locals, I found out that even though women were legally allowed to work outside their homes, cultural and societal expectations made it difficult for them to pursue careers in certain sectors of the workforce, including the travel industry. This discovery made me reflect on my own life and the opportunities that were available in my motherland. I was inspired to return and not take them for granted. Considering my passion for travel, I decided to study languages and to become an English teacher so I can help others to learn new languages and to interact with people from other cultures and to expand their own worldviews. It took me another six years of exploring and traveling to 12 other countries to finally enroll in a program at the Moscow Linguistic University. Part of the curriculum was a semester abroad, which I decided to take in the United States. Yes. <laughs> so my classmate and I went to California and found a great community college in LA. To celebrate, we went to Las Vegas. <laughs> this is where I met Jared. a young man who approached me poolside at the Hilton Hotel and started telling me all about his passion for riding dirt bikes. <laughs> he was competing in the Amateur National Arena Cross Championship in Vegas. I've never seen a dirt bike before and I thought he was a very cool and an extremely brave American. <laughs> Long story short, the very next day to make sure that I can legally stay in America to go on a date with him. He proposed to me. <laughs> That's what brave Americans do, right? <laughs> we were e yeah, yes. <laughs> we were eating at this very not romantic pizza place at that time. <laughs> and he got down on one knee 
and offered me a plastic ring from a Coke bottle. <laughs> I didn't really respond, which it wasn't technically a no. I thought he was crazy. But we were having so much fun together, a part of me was actually considering it. A few days later, I accidentally missed my flight back home. <laughs> That's not what you think. <laughs> In Russia, we use military time, so I was still trying to figure out the difference between AM and PM. That day, I did not succeed, and I was 12 hours late for my 6 AM flight. I thought it was a sign, and I was totally into mirroring him. But my mom said that I've lost my mind, <laughs> and I need to come home. I listened. Jared and I Skyped every day. With the eight-hour time difference, I had to stay up till two in the morning to talk to him. A couple months into our long-distance relationship, I decided to take a semester abroad at the Des Moines Area Community College. near his hometown. <laughs> Jared and I got married five months after our first meeting in Vegas. We've been married for 12 years, and we have a little boy, five years old boy, who is obsessed with traveling just as I am. <laughs> traveling brought transformative experiences into my life. I've met so many wonderful people. Some of them changed my life. I've learned that there's not one way of life, and even if our ways are not the same, we can still be friends. If it was not for travel, I wouldn't be who I am. My parents showed me that the world is bigger than a small Siberian town. My solo travel inspired me to pursue my passion and study languages, and my first trip to America led me to my husband and a wonderful Midwest nice community in Iowa. <laughs> which I'm forever grateful for. <laughs> Traveling the world with an open heart and a willingness to learn could be a deeply rewarding experience that can broaden your perspective and enrich your life in countless ways. But keep in mind, what happens in Vegas <laughs> doesn't always stay in Vegas. <laughs> Spasiba Alicia Ochen Harashach. <laughs> Our next storyteller is Susan Sims. There I was in Chengdu, deep in the west of communist China. The artist in front of me showed me a beautiful and massive hand painted scroll of the most exquisite landscape. He wanted $100 for it. I had about $150 on my person in a country that had no such thing as an ATM. But my friend told me that all agreed he was the best artist in the city. And when was I ever going to get another chance like this? And so I bartered for it, and I made the purchase for $50, still a princely sum at that time and place. It was 1986, and I was 22. I had been studying land reform in Taiwan, and I was on my way back to the US for graduate school. But I wanted to see China. It had just begun to open up to tourists. I couldn't afford a normal tour, and I didn't want to go on one of those anyway. I wanted to see the real China, even if I had to go alone. And so I did what I would never have allowed any of my children to do. <laughs> I stowed my belongings in a locker at the Salvation Army Hotel in Hong Kong, in an era where there were no cell phones, at a time when no one could know where I was at any given moment. I went to a backpack shop, and I bought a bootleg visa. I was a little naive. I was also poor. I could only afford to spare about $200 for my entire two-week journey. So I outfitted my new but comically small backpack with a change of clothes, a roll of toilet paper, a jar of peanut butter, a bag of M&Ms, a package of disposable chopsticks, and one disposable bottle of water, one. I had two rolls of film for my camera, but only one set of batteries and one set of batteries for my Panasonic version of a Walkman. I had but one cassette tape, also bootleg. It was Dire Straits, Band of Brothers. <laughs> the M&Ms and the music were reserved for, well, the most dire of straits. 
neither of them lasted very long because I was so woefully unprepared for such a journey. I am astonished I survived. I'd forgotten to take malaria pills. My vague travel plans fell apart after about the second day when I realized I couldn't always pick where I wanted to go if I wanted to go anywhere in a country that had no transportation network. I had been in Canton, now Guangzhou, for about a day when I bumped into a black marketeer who told me where I could get local Chinese currency instead of what the government issued to tourists. That money was only good for what the government wanted tourists to buy. I wanted to shop in normal stores, even if they didn't sell very much. So the dodgy person told me where the drop point was, <laughs> under a bridge. <laughs> and so that's where I went to get my cash. Soon I had rented a flying rabbit bicycle to tour around the city. I was involved in three minor collisions. I broke two laws and I had my bike impounded. <laughs> I was getting really good at petty crime. Or, or I, I couldn't read Chinese, one or the other. So I booked passage on a packed, slow-moving boat with no chairs, no deck, or anything remotely comfortable for an 18-hour ride inland. It was at this point that I had to ask myself, what was I thinking when I did this? Maybe it was the cold rice or the cockroaches or the utter lack of dignity or privacy lying shoulder to shoulder on thin mats on this boat with total strangers. But no, I think it was the spider hotel that doubled as the open air latrine on the back of the boat. <laughs> as multiple things began to descend to inspect me, I tried not to look up because I hate spiders. But there they were. It was like Charlotte descending to greet Wilbur. <laughs> Only lots of Charlottes, and I was not pleased to make their acquaintance. <laughs> but I was disavowed of my regret and rewarded for all my troubles when I finally made it to the then tiny hamlet of Yang Shuo in the midst of the most beautiful limestone mountains I could have imagined. Suddenly, it was all worth it. Other backpackers, mostly from Europe, were abundant, and so I found company for dinner. The meal was the most delicious beef and broccoli stir fry I have ever eaten. So as I was leaving the little restaurant, I decided to peek into the kitchen. <laughs> and I thought, I'm going to die. <laughs> I thought the same thing at my little hotel, a converted house, as I settled in for the night under an expansive pink mosquito net. And the walls began to move. I tucked that net underneath me, and I did not sleep very much most of the night until early morning when the spiders began to retreat. Well, I rented another bicycle to ride around those captivating mountains. It was another world entirely. I don't think I broke any laws that day, but I did disappoint two young Chinese farmers who saw my camera and signaled that I should take their picture and then waited expectantly for a photo to appear. I didn't have a Polaroid. I didn't even know what they, how they knew what a Polaroid was. They lived in a mud house with no windows or electricity. Well, with my limited Chinese, I made my apologies, and I kept cycling around the mountains. To my surprise, the only place I could afford to get to next was Chengdu, a city I had barely heard of and wasn't intending to visit. But I went. My mode of transportation was an airplane. It flew at about 5,000 feet, and it rattled like it was about to fall apart at any moment. We didn't even have fixed seats. They gave us folding chairs. <laughs> they clipped into the floor. But the flight attendants gave us snack boxes to take our minds off of crashing. And so it worked. The view was great, and we landed safely. I had struck up a friendship with a young Chinese swimmer on that flight. And we decided to spend the next day together. Chengdu is where I saw my first panda. It's where I saw homes carved out of mountains like caves with wooden entrances. It's also where I ate my first Sichuan food and I hope never to have experienced that again. <laughs> but this is also where my friend and I encountered the artist with the scroll. 
having made that prized purchase, I mused in my journal that night that I might regret it if I run out of money, but it was worth the risk. I took that scroll with me everywhere. It was stood about four feet high. I tied a string around it and I strapped it on my back and I took it everywhere. I even slept with it when I was in communal settings, which was, which was frequently. Well, the next city to beckon was Xi'an, the ancient capital, mostly because it was the only city in a northerly direction that I could get to from Chengdu. But what a beautiful city. The ancient walls were still there. About a decade before, the terracotta soldiers had been unearthed. And I was able to witness some of the early efforts at excavation. Much of what I saw in the rest of the city occurred as I was running around trying to find a hotel that would let me in. Backpackers were routinely turned away from hotels that only catered to tour companies. But the Double Dragon Hotel was perfect for me anyway. Cost, $3. It was meant for Chinese tourists. I had the distinction of being the first American to stay there. But the manager was so kind and so helpful that he made sure I had a clean bed and a nice mosquito net. And then the next morning, he drove me to the train station in his brand new van like I was some sort of celebrity visitor. That level of personal kindness was indicative of the normal people that I met, in contrast to the government functionaries that I had to deal with on occasion. Case in point, my next stop, Beijing. Money was tight, and so I had to take a train. But the ticket master was not going to sell an American backpacker any ticket of any kind. She said the train was full. Well, third class is never really full, and I knew this. And I knew that this was my only chance to get to Beijing. And so while I understood no ticket and her efforts to get me to leave the counter, I put on my dumb American girl act. And I said, yes, Beijing, ticket, third class, thank you. Kept pushing my money forward until she finally gave up in exasperation and sold me the ticket. <laughs> I soon regretted not having more money for a better ticket. For traveling in the 1980s on a Chinese train put me in the company in third class with heavily smoking and yelling men stacked three high in bunks of cabins that held six people with only enough room to hop out of the bunk. I spent most of my time wandering the narrow hallway next to the windows so I could breathe. But finally, finally I was in the city I had been trying to reach, Beijing, the capital. It was vast, dusty, full of bikes and buses and some cars. Lodging for backpackers was in a seedy part of town where they put us all in a communal room on cots, no mosquito nets. Mosquitoes weren't really a problem that far north, so that was okay. Bed bugs, however, were plentiful. I woke up the next morning with bites from head to toe. I might have preferred Charlotte back on the boat <laughs> to these nighttime visitors. But I learned the next night to line my cot with newspaper and sleep on top of everything I had. Just like my troubles back on the boat, this headache was worth it because Beijing was the gateway to the Great Wall, which in those days was so curious and so mysterious to me. So I met up with some Swedish girls who were planning to go visit the wall. We had a great time climbing the steeper portions as we went along that beautiful wall that snaked along the mountain ridges like a giant serpent. Then we went into the city to see the Forbidden City and Tiananmen Square. I took a few pictures of the soldiers when they weren't looking. It would only be three years later that I would see that same space on TV and watch a lone man stare down a tank. Well, my Swedish friends went their way as I wandered around the Chinese communist museums. And then I got lost trying to get back to the hostel where I was staying. And then I almost passed out with dehydration. But I had a larger problem looming over me. I had no money. I started thinking, I'm going to be trapped in China. Fortunately for me, 
I learned that Visa International had just recently established a connection to the Bank of China. It took some hunting, but I was able to find the right office to where I could get a cash advance so I could buy a first-class ticket on a 36-hour express sleeper train all the way to the southern border. I had been wanting to get there. I was 2,000 kilometers away, and I needed to get to Hong Kong for my flight to South Korea. So when I got to the train, it was such a luxury. No Charlottes to greet me in the loo. A door on the cabin. Yes, I was sharing space with some strangers, but that wasn't a problem. When I got to the border, I was able to walk into Hong Kong, then still part of the British Empire, with great relief. Soon, I'd gathered my belongings out of the locker, and I was on a flight to South Korea to see a friend before I could head home. I was still dangerously low on cash. Remember, I was poor. So I couldn't afford a hotel in Seoul. My friend's professor and his wife offered me a place to stay that night. It was very kind. They also took me shopping for clothes. I didn't think I looked that ragtag. <laughs> in our conversations, I told them about my scroll, how I'd coddled it, how I prized it, how I took such care of it. And then as I showed it to the professor, he reacted with such emotion because it reminded him of his ancestral homeland. And because of his political activities, he was barred from traveling to China. Suddenly I knew I had a decision to make, to thank them for their kindness and to give them hope that the professor might one day return to his homeland. I gave them the scroll. It kind of broke my heart to part with that beautiful piece of artwork that I had been dreaming about hanging on some future wall in some future home. But I knew it was the right thing to do. So I boarded my last flight with a few trinkets I had picked up along the way, hopefully some photos on my camera roll, and a lot of great memories of a grand adventure. People ask me, would I do this again? Not in the way I did it. It was reckless, this is what I tell my children, irresponsible. <laughs> and anyway, adventures are not repeatable. That's what makes them such singular treasures to share on occasion with new friends. <laughs>